You're watching World Talks here on TVP World. I'm Aaron Darman. Romania and Bulgaria are set to join the passport-free Schengen area from January as Austria agrees to lift its long-held veto. The two Eastern European countries have been battling for years to get Vienna's approval. The move was revealed by the Hungarian presidency of the EU Council at a meeting in Budapest. Here to discuss this process and why it repeatedly hit a stumbling block is Managing Director of Euro Creative Romain Le Quinu. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. So let's dig into the timeline here. Why has it taken so long and how significant is this breakthrough? Yes, it's, it's a significant breakthrough, of course, for Romania and Bulgaria. And I think that citizens today in this both in this country should be happy of finally seeing the end of the tunnel, right? Uh, but it shows also that it has been a problem for the European Union for many years. And the reason is quite simple. It's about internal politics. We know that the European Commission has, gave, has given its green light uh, already in 2011, saying that both Bulgaria and Romania were ready technically to join the, spa the, the, the Schengen space, but uh, it took 11 years. Why? Because some countries and some uh, political parties in these countries, um, namely Austria, but also the Netherlands, decided to block this uh, membership for a simple reason. Uh, they were using this uh, political affair, they were using this political uh, membership to say that uh, uh, to put migration, illegal, irregular migration as a topic into the national politics. So it shows that in the European Union, we still have a lot of issues when it comes to interference of internal, internal politics into the EU affairs. How difficult is that to navigate, those internal politics? I mean, we've seen, for example, in Germany putting up border checks and others have said that's not in the spirit of uh, the Schengen zone. How do you balance those interests if you're a country from your domestic political audience to what the EU is meant to stand for? Well, it's always difficult, but in, uh, we know that it's even more difficult when it comes to migration. It's not the first time you mentioned Germany, but uh, Germany has reintroduced border controls a few weeks, a few months ago, and it was not the first time. Frankly speaking, we had this in many countries for many years um, during COVID crisis, but also I would say even before in France, uh, during the waves of terrorist attacks, uh, there was back the control of the borders also for big events such as um, you know the COP24 for example a few years ago so this is not new and countries decide basically unitary or not to reintroduce border checks uh, during COVID during migration crisis and it's always a problem because the EU um, functions if uh, there is um, cohesion if there is unity when it comes to decisions but of course sometimes it's not possible to achieve that and um, we have leaders we have political parties that have interest political interest in the short term to take unilateral decisions that can impact all of the EU. Romania and Bulgaria did actually enter the Schengen zone by air and sea in March. So what made the negotiation of a land so difficult? I think it was very clear since the beginning. Austria was blocking and Austria at that moment was in a constant political crisis. So at, me, at least um, the political party that was heading the government, the ÖVP and Prime Minister Nehammer, uh, they were in difficulty at home combating the far right party and the rise of the far right party, the FPÖ. And their uh, bet was that uh, they needed to be strong or at least to appear strong on migration. And one of the opportunity for them was to say no to to Bulgaria and to Romania because they were saying that um, the membership of these countries could lead to an increase of migration numbers in Austria, which is largely debatable, but this was uh, an issue that was active politically in Austria. Now, the government uh, is not formed yet, but they had election a few, a few weeks ago, and the coalition is being formed. So probably this was also something in the debate. The elections have been, do have been done. Um, they will form a government. Uh, we will see which one, but they will form one. So now they have more space, they have more um, uh, liberty to accept and to give it fully to Romania and Bulgaria. This all comes at a delicate time for the Schengen zone. We've talked about the likes of Germany. Do you think the region can handle more members, that it can handle more cooks in the kitchen? Of course, I think this is a strategic uh, affair for the EU. This is a strategic necessity for the EU. And, uh, you know, we talk about Schengen. Uh, being in Schengen is being part of the family in a way. Um, because uh, the Schengen space is one of the most important pillars of the European Union and it's functioning. It's about the liberty of movement, the liberty of goods. Uh, so we have to say that it's uh, a symbol that they are entering fully into the EU. 
of many years after the, the entry into the EU, but also it brings benefits, economic benefits, for example, because uh, you have less logistical problem, you have less time at the border, you have, um, you know, it's easier simply to, to, uh, to cross the borders for the, the economic and the goods. Um, but also if we talk about the Schengen space and the fact that uh, these countries, despite fulfilling the technical criteria for more than a decade, were blocked, um, we can say, and we can talk also about the difficulties of the EU, uh, um, currently when it comes to enlargement and I think that for a long time for the countries that are candidate today you know countries in the Western Balkans Ukraine Moldova um, it was a very very uh, bad symbol for them uh, to see that Romania and Bulgaria despite being members of the European Union despite being fulfilling the technical criteria were not able to enter Schengen so I think that at least today it's not done yet uh, there is an agreement now it needs to be um, you know validated by uh, the member states also by the Dutch parliament but if we go to that if we go there if we finally have Romania and Bulgaria to the European Union then it's a positive signal for everyone and in particular also for Romania because we should not forget that Romania is going to a very important month they will have the uh, presidential election next uh, next Sunday uh, and also pre uh, parliamentary election uh, next week. So this is very important also for Romania, for the political parties today that are facing a rise also of anti-system party, anti-European party. So that's a good sign for everyone. These two countries have been developing at vastly different rates. Why do you think that is? And do you get a sense that both Romania and Bulgaria are actually well prepared to enter the Schengen zone? Absolutely. Uh, the technical reports have been showing that for years and years. Um, there is the technical requirements, but there is also some attention that was given um, to the numbers of uh, irregular mi migrants uh, passing by the border. And we know that for the last few years, um, the, um, the numbers of irregular migration coming through uh, the Turkish-Bulgarian uh, border has been decreasing a lot. Uh, I think that the, the, the caretaker prime minister um, today or yesterday said that it was decreasing by 70%. So this is numbers that prove that, one, uh, there is less risk, threat on this external borders of the EU, but also that uh, Romania and Bulgaria have been um, managing the borders, their borders, as well as the EU external borders, fairly uh, good. And this is uh, totally normal that they will now enter uh, the Schengen space. But countries, for example, like Bulgaria, have also faced real political instability. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel like that a country with so much political instability can rightfully ascend to an area like Schengen and be part of, like what you mentioned earlier, a family like that? I think, of course. I mean, you know, uh, many countries are facing some political troubles. Bulgaria is in a specific case, of course. We are talking about seven elections in a row. But still, uh, this is something that can happen in many countries. And we know that even big countries, funding member states today, have a uh, quite volatile uh, political scene. But, um, you know, it's not because you don't have a functioning government, I mean, a political government, that you don't have a government and you don't have uh, an administration, that you don't have people working on a daily basis. Uh, for example, the the, the, the borders are not stopping, uh, the controls on the borders are not stopping because you don't have a proper government. So it remains. Will the entry into the Schengen zone eventually make it easier for these two countries to really fully integrate into Europe, to properly become part of that family? They are properly part of the family and it was just, you know, a technical thing that they didn't have this um, membership to the Schengen But it's a uh, crucial area. part, right? It's, it's, it's a crucial one, but they are part of the family. Now it means about the integration. I, you know that Bulgaria, for example, is aiming to join the Eurozone as well, to adopt the Euro currency in the next few, in the next few months. Uh, will they make it or not? We don't know. But there is, um, I think, in Romania and in Bulgaria, uh, especially from the mainstream parties, a will to integrate integrate more into the EU, to, to, to participate more in the EU. And, you know, we know to, to speak also about bigger topics, for example, foreign policy and the relations with, with Ukraine, with, uh, against Russia. We can see that the governments, the last governments in Romania, as well as in Bulgaria, when there was a government, uh, they've been totally aligned on the EU. And they were very important in the support of Ukraine militarily, financially also welcoming the refugees from Ukraine. So they are fully part of the European Union. They are fully part of the European family. And this is just right finally to give them uh, the membership to the Schengen area. 
For our international viewers, I also want to boil down just a little bit to what actually makes the accession to the Schengen zone so important, so critical to countries like Bulgaria, like Romania. I think once again, when you are part of the family, you want to share everything. And uh, this was very important for Bulgaria. This was really important for Romania to not being denied of uh, something that all the countries have been obtaining. And they wanted to join, and this is normal. The control of the border in the European Union, uh, also for strategic reasons, should be full. And you cannot leave away countries um, outside of this, of this control of the borders, of border management. It's about solidarity, it's about unity, and we need to be um, a community where uh, our basic functioning is applicable to everyone, to all members of the family. So this is, once again, mutually beneficial today, uh, and we hope that it will have a positive effect also on the population, because I understand very much citizens being frustrated of being, you know, uh, not fully part of the, of the family. And now it's the case on this specific topic and this is good. We've talked a little bit about domestic politics really playing into different nations and different countries' roles in the EU. Do you feel like that countries looking inward, looking into their own country, looking to respond to their own domestic politics, puts the EU at risk? It puts the EU at risk, of course, but this is also a normal the situation. the stability of the EU. It, it, of course, this is, a, this is a problem and this is a threat for cohesion. But we need also to understand that the EU is made of 27 member states and that, you know, there is this beautiful sentence of the EU, the united in diversity. And I think that it's very important to have the unity, but it's also important to understand the diversity. And this is something we need to emphasize. Politic, um, member states have also national interest, even if they are much more aligned with the European interest. Interest, still, this is very important uh, to, to mention it. But uh, this is true that it's, it's very important for countries to go to the same direction. And you can have inter uh, internal interests, you can have domestic interests, you can have uh, some positions that are a bit different than your neighbours and that the other partners, but it's important also that we are going to the same direction. I don't think it's important to talk about this, you know, internal domestic uh, interest and the fact that it can threaten the EU. I think what is very necessary is that the EU countries understand the longer term interests. And this is where we've been failing as Europeans until now, strategically speaking. Um, more, most of the time, it's not because we think too much about our country. It's not because we think too much inward that uh, we create some uh, difficulties for the EU. I think that uh, what is threatening is that when we have political leaders, especially from mainstream parties, that are uh, trying to favor uh, short term domestic interests rather than long-term interests, because this is how we will make sure that Europe is able to face the geopolitical um, challenges in the next few years, that the European Union is able to build itself uh, with its member states as uh, you know, a union that is powerful, that is secure, that is prosperous, that is democratic, and this is with a common vision that will make it. But we should never deny also some national interests, some national positions, but always in the same direction. Managing Director of Euro Creative, Ome Le Quenu, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And that's this edition of World Talks here on TVP World. Do stay with us and you can join us online at tvpworld.com. I'm Aaron Darman. Goodbye for now.